thanks so much to the organizers and all of you um, for, for being here. And I guess in this presentation, which is just sort of a, I guess it's a spinoff of, of something I almost included as a chapter in the book that for reasons that'll become sort of obvious in a minute, um, I didn't really, I didn't think it was really form. I, I didn't think I had the source material to really come up with much um, at first. And I'm hopefully gonna be able to bridge some of the concerns of, of the practitioners like Rosemary and G and Dina who are actually in the field in terms of the kinds of concerns that they have in their work with um, those of us who are more, you know, you know, sort of, you know, ensconced in academia doing, doing research. And um, I wanted to particularly highlight here uh, some of the challenges that you have in terms of using different uh, uh, written archives um, from say UNHCR and, and some faith-based organizations and interviews as well. Um, because for those of us who are looking say at the 1960s and early 1970s, um, if we wanted to understand the day-to-day -day challenges in the way that Dina and Rosemary and she have kind of explicated, it's a very challenging, there's a whole series of challenges that, we're, that I'm gonna be looking at um, in this presentation. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. So you'll have another wordy PowerPoint to enjoy or be distracted by. And I guess first off, I'll talk um, about why I picked this particular case study of looking at Sudanese refugees living in the northeastern part of the Democratic Republic of Congo in the late 1960s or in early 1970s. And I'm assuming no one has any real background on this. Um, not many African, uh, res like African-based researchers or researchers in North America or Europe really do either. This isn't a major refugee crisis that draws the same kind of attention that, that you would see in um, say the Nigerian civil war of the late 1960s, for example, or South Africans living in exile. And that um, I think a case like this as relatively obscure as it might seem um, is important for historians who are engaged with questions of refugees, um, the changing role and, and goals of humanitarian organizations dealing with refugees, in the 1960s and 1970s after, you know, in early post-independence Africa in many countries, um, because this case does not fit the kinds of case studies that have already been done. Um, in some cases, there's been research like by a woman named Joanna Tog um, based at Denison University in the US on Mozambicans in Tanzania. They were sponsored and supported by the Tanzanian government. So in other words, in some cases, refugees are going to be welcomed by host countries. And that's one major example um, for ideological reasons in terms of victims of colonialism fleeing the, from, from, the, from the Portuguese, and as well as fitting into nation, the, the goals of nation building and economic development um, that Julius Nyerere, the leader of Tanzania at that time was really promoting. Um, Another kind of, of case study, which is more common in terms of dealing with refugees, um, would be looking at the major role of state actors and international agencies in terms of either supporting or potentially seeing refugees as threats. That for example, in the Nigerian civil war and the, the, the failed secession of, of Biafra in the late 1960s, that draws in a tremendous amount of international attention. It helps lead to the creation of uh, Doctors Without Borders, for example. Um, it's a real challenge for the Red Cross and so on. And there's been, a, there's been work by Nigerians, by many scholars looking at these kinds of issues, these political issues that oftentimes uh, directly connect with faith-based organizations and uh, and governments in, Europe, in, in Western Europe and in North America. Another case slightly potentially less known would be looking at the case of Rwandan refugees who fled um, in the uh, early 1960s, primarily Tutsi exiles. Um, in many cases, these are seen in some countries as threats like in the Congo, where they, these are basically refugees that need to be controlled. In other cases, you're gonna have more of a role of, of UNHCR and, or, and other organizations in terms of not just providing aid, but also trying to control the movement of these particular refugees. Now, in the case of Sudanese refugees in the Northeast Congo, they don't really fit into either of these different categories that I've raised. Um, they're neither favored or 
discriminated against by the host government. And um, as we'll see, the Congolese government is going to take a laissez-faire approach to these refugees in many cases, not providing aid, not providing really a whole lot of support, but not trying to force people into camps, not trying to closely monitor the day-to-day -day experiences of people living in settlements in, uh, in, in exile. They're also going to be a group that is going to, uh, like in, at least in the Northeastern part of Congo, these Sunnis refugees do not really engage very much with uh, transnational faith-based organizations and UNHCR for reasons that I'll get into. And lastly, Sudanese refugees in the late 60s and early 70s in a wildly different way than what you will see later on in the second civil war um, between 1983 and 2005, that the Sudanese refu uh, refugees and particularly supporters of the rebel movement against the Sudanese government really fail to generate a lot of international support through their plight, through their through the humanitarian crisis that was that 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 had basically led them to flee southern Sudan. So this is very, very different than later on in the 1980s and 1990s, where many evangelical North American humanitarian organizations, for example, look at Sudanese refugees as sort of a, a favored, uh, like a favored object of assistance. Um, that's not the case in this earlier period. So in short, these Sudanese refugees in the northeastern part of Congo in the late 60s and early 70s are really at the margins of surveillance of both the Congolese state and international organizations, which I argue in a larger paper is, a, is most likely have been a very common kind of situation with many refugee groups in Africa in the 60s and 70s and well beyond, but also creates all kinds of problems for historians and others trying to engage in historical research to try to understand the agency and try to understand the experiences and choices of refugees on the ground. So um, I'm going to refer to this next part uh, in what I'm going to call silences using the uh, the term uh, by Michel uh, Rolf Trujillo, a, a, a Haitian historian, looking at the kinds of silences you find in humanitarian uh, archives regarding the student needs and trying to come up with some explanations for them. One challenge is going to be that when there are when there is when there are when there is material about uh, uh, Sunni refugees in the late 1960s and early 1970s, it's primarily from Uganda. That was the base of the Sudanese African National Union, which was the main political organization promoting uh, the rebellion in Southern Sudan against the uh, Sudanese government. And I'm not going into a whole lot of detail about the rebellion. I can do that if in, in, the, in the question and answer period if people are interested. Um, but suffice it to say, although a, a majority of Southern Sudanese refugees fled into Uganda, Others fled into the Central African Republic and into the, into the Congo. However, ne the group, uh, Sudanese refugees in the Central African Republic and the Congo have not received very much attention at all. Um, and also, they tend to be much less visible in the work that Sanu actually publishes and, um, regarding the crisis. The main focus is on the experiences of refugees in Uganda. So silence number one is that Sunnis who went to the Democratic Republic of Congo are not getting nearly as much attention as uh, from Uganda, even among uh, Sunnis rebel organizations themselves. The second silence is going to have to do with the, uh, the government policies of the Democratic Republic of Congo. Now, um, I, you could potentially argue that the Congolese government is sort of a pioneer of trying to get NGOs to do work that wouldn't oftentimes would associate with the state. Um, it, certainly in the 1960s, in terms of education and healthcare and so on, the Congolese government was really not willing to fund very much of those kinds of social services. Um, and for the Congolese government, refugees received a low priority generally in the 1960s in terms of assistance, given the kinds of political turmoil and civil wars in the 1960s, it's perfectly, un you could certainly be a rational kind of response. But even then, Sunnis refugees received very little um, attention compared to others, particularly Angolan refugees who had fled Portuguese rule in the 1960s. So Congolese sources don't provide much uh, information about refugees. And more generally, the Congolese government does not really see the Sunnis refugees as, as much of an issue in terms of actually provide, providing uh, written records uh, on them. 
The third silence is going to be this limited humanitarian presence. Um, and I'll take UNHCR, and I happen to have a chance to go to the UNHCR archives in 2017 and found some limited material about um, assistance to uh, Sudanese refugees in the Congo. First off, UNHCR staff spent most of their time, at least in 1966 and 1967, trying to woo the Congolese government to actually act as a, uh, as a partner. Um, that the UNHCR at that point had a pretty clear policy to avoid working with non-state actors, AKA rebel groups like, like SANU. And uh, the Congolese government in turn um, was happy to ask UNHCR to intervene, but then did not provide money or much support. And so this actually drags on all the way to the end of the first uh, uh, Sudanese war or civil war in 1972. Um, so in other words, the UNHCR was trying to get the Congolese government to do something and the Congolese government, although promising to do, actually intervene to assist refugees, never actually quite got around to doing it. Secondly, UNHCR and faith-based organizations more generally had their resources were already strained in 1966 and 1967 when increasing numbers of Sudanese were fleeing um, military campaigns, uh, counterinsurgency campaigns in Southern Sudan into the Congo. Um, Congolese civilians in many areas were suffering from famine and uh, deprivation as a result of the leftist rebellions known as the Simba rebellions of the mid 1960s. And over 300,000 Angolan refugees had fled colonial rule into Western uh, DRC. So UNHCR and faith-based organizations didn't have a lot of resources on the ground to provide assistance to the Northeast. Um, lastly, in terms of silences, in terms of UNHCR priorities, it's clearly not dealing directly with refugees. Um, that much of the uh, correspondence I did have a chance to look at primarily dealt with a accord between the Sudanese and Congolese governments. That in early 1967, the two governments agreed to uh, basically start trying to relocate refugees close to the border. Um, many uh, former Congolese rebels had fled into southern Sudan. The Sudanese government promised to move them over 150 kilometers away. The Congolese government promised to move Sud uh, Sudanese refugees um, south away from the, the Sudanese border. Um, and UNHCR tried to insert itself into this, these negotiations with limited success. Um, there's actually very, very little about direct interactions with refugees at all in the UNHCR correspondence that was available to me looking at 1966 and 1967. And one striking thing is out of say, 200 or so um, individual uh, files, um, only one was actually a file in which you had a letter that was written by a Sudanese refugee um, himself. And the response of, the U of UNHCR staff is quite telling to this one report, that this one report basically requested, among other things, that UNHCR negotiate directly with SANU. Um, the response of, a, uh, of one UNHCR Looking at this letter was was to ask, you know, are are these are these informations correct? Can't we have court? Uh, can't we have a can't we have Congolese government confirmation that this person is 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 information is correct about how many refugees are entering the country? So even when you have sources directly written by refugees, and they're few and few and far between in in the UNHCR archives. Um, UNHCR staff clearly have doubts about these individuals in a way they do not show doubts about individual Europeans um, providing information to them. So there's a number of different challenges in terms of trying to understand uh, Sudanese refugees perspectives because the, with these different silences, it's hard to get a sense of what their views are at all. I was fortunate last month to interview three different people um, who had different experiences dealing with what I'm going to refer to as FBOs or faith-based organizations um, in, uh, from 1965 to 1967. Um, I interviewed a uh, former volunteer with the Church World Service, which is a mainline Protestant organization that had a very big presence in many African countries in the 1960s and 70s. It's still quite large today. Um, and he was stationed in the Central African Republic in 1966. 
for several months and then return and basically returned to Africa in 1967 to do similar work distributing food and supplies to Sudanese refugees, but this time in northeastern Congo. Um, I also tracked down two Sudanese refugees uh, who had fled to northeastern Congo and lived there in the late 1960s and early 1970s, Martin Makaya and Gaz Archangelo. Arch uh, um, this is obviously a very unrepresentative sample that you have um, at least 40,000 Congo uh, Sudanese refugees fleeing to the Congo. <laughs> so a grand total of three of two Sudanese and one aid worker. It's not what you call a representative sample to put it mildly. There's no women, there's no current uh, residents of the Congo or South Sudan. So I'm not really claiming one can generalize very much from these three different uh, interviews in terms of finding perspectives. But one thing that is striking is um, even with these three individuals, um, how different the challenges refugees faced um, as they fled from Southern Sudan into Congo were and how, they, and how others viewed them. Um, and they also are significantly different from the written records, primarily from faith-based organizations like Church World Service and from UNHCR. So I'll give a couple of quick examples and one would be coming to the Congo. Um, Larry Spears' uh, recollections of, refu of refugees were primarily focused on viewing them as basically stragglers just entering the country with practically nothing, whether in the Central African Republic and the Congo. Um, he, um, he oftentimes, uh, when I asked him how, you know, how did you identify Sudanese refugees, he told me that he relied on his small group of workers who traveled along um, um, uh, basically uh, rutted roads in the Eastern Central African Republic and in the Congo to basically speak to the refugees directly most of the time. Larry Spears had no, really no clear qualifications for doing what he was doing. Um, he spoke a little French. He did not know any African languages. He had no real background in development either. He was about 25 at the time. Um, so he gave a lot of credit to his work uh, to his workers for doing a lot of the tr basic translation about identifying who actually needed aid, um, and that he had a basic question that his his uh, his his small group of four or five workers would basically translate for him, you know, um, and in French it would be "Où sont les mazakini?" Um, that basically uh, in English would be "Who are the mazakini?" Mazakini is a, a Congolese Swahili word meaning poor people. Who are the like the or who are the desperate ones? Um, so Spears's views of refugees are basically filtered through these Congolese that he gave a lot of credit for, um, for assess, uh, assisting him in um, in um, basically providing aid and negotiating with refugees. And Spears really didn't have much direct contact with refugees, relatively speaking, other than literally handing out aid from a truck and leaving. So he's not going to have much of a firsthand experience or be able to really communicate very well with the refugees much of the time. Um, this is significantly different, not surprisingly, from the standpoint of the Sudanese refugees themselves. Um, Martin Makaya and Ghost Archangelo both described how they fled the, uh, of the Sudan in 1965 as the Sudanese military started to increasingly crack down on southern Sudanese people. But even then, their experiences were wildly different. In the case of Martin Makaya, he and his family decide, collectively decided to leave the southern Sudanese village of Ye to travel a short distance um, over the span of a year and a year and a half to avoid um, Sudanese troops into the, uh, into the Congo itself. So for Martin, he basically looked at this movement as a, a time in which his family would show their perseverance, but also not view it as a big dislocation in terms of at least maintaining a sense of family identity and community. Goz Archangelo was a, um, in his first year of secondary school in 1965, when he decided to run away from his home village after government troops arrived in or hometown of Wow, not a village, a city. And when government troops opened fire on a wedding, um, he and uh, uh, at least several dozen other uh, male secondary students basically fled wow, didn't tell their families, and were basically escorted by Southern Sudanese rebels to go all the way to the Congo. So experiences between refugees is, go is going to be different. And then an aid worker's recollections of what Sudanese experiences are like, are, is oftentimes it's gonna be really limited. Um, another way you can see this play out 
is going to be discussions of ethnic identities. Spears, um, when I asked him how he identified Sunnis refugees, would say, well, they looked different. They were taller, they were darker, many of them spoke English. And to connect with Marsha's presentation, um, some of them also asked him in English how he could help them get scholarships to study at universities in the United States. And uh, his response was more or less, I'm just delivering food from a truck. Like, I can't do any of the things you're asking me to do. Um, when I asked Martin Makaya and goes, uh, uh, goes uh, Arch Angelo the same questions, they kind of laughed it off because they belonged to ethnic groups that were found both in Southern Sudan and in the Congo. And Martin Makaya actually recalled um, walking around Isiro, a relatively large city in Northeastern Congo, and uh, hearing people make, um, start to describe in the Congolese language of Lingala what Sudanese refugees are like to him, thinking he was Congolese, that they would basically say in Lingala, oh, they're very tall and they're very black, which he did not fit that category. And then he would tell them, well, actually, I'm a Sudanese refugee. I look like one of you because my people live in, Europe, live, live in, in Sudan and in Congo. Um, so again, um, oral accounts are going to have their own kinds of distinctions as well. Um, uh, lastly, from the standpoint of Spears, he viewed the refugees as being very disorganized, as being sort of defeated and exhausted. Um, for both um, Micaiah and Archangelo, they described themselves as being very organized. Um, even Archangelo, who would come as a 14-year-old, 15-year-old with no real support, no family, um, he would describe living in a camp um, in which there had committees that were formed, uh, where you had a treasurer, where you're going to have minutes that were taken and so on to run the settlement. Um, so whereas from an aid worker's perspective, refugees may, see, may have seemed to be very disorganized and, and you know, in a really chaotic position, that may have not been how refugees really viewed themselves, that they, were, they, were, they saw themselves as active participants in trying to shape the refugee experience rather than just victims. Um, I'm going to skip now. I'm going to check the time, too. Um, I guess I have oh, only like five minutes, so I'm going to skip things um, really quickly. I'm going to look, look at a last case study, which I'm going to just be summarizing briefly, about what, um, despite these silences, what can we potentially learn by looking at sort of a micro studies of the challenges of humanitarian aid organizations and um, refugees uh, working with one another, as well as the challenge in trying to, turn, to interpret these kinds of sources. And it has to do with a revolt that took place at a refugee, uh, a school that was set up for Sudanese refugees and for Congolese that was partially funded by the UNHCR and partially funded by faith-based organizations. I'm going to refer to it as ESPE, as sort of that's the acronym of the school. So in November 1970, a group of Sudanese and Congolese students take, took over the school chased off um, the principal, an American named Charles Bailiff, um, uh, threw rocks and threatened to um, uh, attack volunteer North American uh, teachers with machetes. And uh, the standoff lasted for about a little less than a week. In written accounts, primarily coming from the Church World Service, uh, unruly students are blamed. Um, that in both um, interviews I, I managed to make with former teachers at the school and with um, and in the written correspondence, there was an assumption that some of the some of the Sudanese um, students at the school had, had in fact been Sudanese rebels and military experience, and that some of the Congolese students were in fact people who had fought for the Simba. So in other words, you had war veterans who were now going to school and they were kind of blamed for starting the revolt. The second cause of the revolt in written accounts would be a conflict between Charles Bailiff, this, this U.S. South, he's basically like from Mississippi, he was from Mississippi, um, was a C the CWS volunteer and the principal of the school with a Sunni's uh, teacher named Carl Ingeberde, who was a, um, he, he had been a principal in uh, a Ugandan school and a, a teacher with a lot of experience in the Sudan prior, before becoming a refugee. When I interviewed uh, uh, US volunteers who had taught at the school, they praised Bailiff for his discipline. And they also noted he had had a lot of problems in the past um, he'd been he'd been dismissed from a from the CD, CWS aid program in Biafra, on the grounds that he argued aid was only perpetuating this, uh, the Nigerian civil war and should be immediately ended. 
and he had been kicked out of the Central African Republic, apparently in a dispute about food that had had a that was destined for Sudanese refugees, including um, boxes of milk that had um, a gorilla on it. Apparently, that was the uh, the brand's logo of the uh, from from the Netherlands. And that CR uh, CAR um, officials saw this as an ins as a racist insult and actually ordered Bailiff to leave the country, even though he then put they you know put, didn't put the grill on the aid. Um, some of the Mennonite volunteers argued Bailiff was too much of a disciplinarian, and volunteers took credit for trying to settle things down with the students. To finish up, um, the refugee the two refugee students former refugee students I uh, spoke to praise Inga Berde as a model teacher, as a respected authority, and as somebody who was actually qualified to be a principal because he'd already been a principal in Uganda and he was a longtime teacher. Bailiff was seen as an inexperienced principal who was patronizing, authoritarian, and also a big source of money. And so what Martin Micaiah, for example, remembered telling fellow students, he may force you to wear these uniforms, he may, he may be really insulting to you, but he brings in a lot of money for the school. Um, a bailiff was, uh, from the standpoint of both Sudanese refugee, uh, uh, former refugees that I spoke with, was really insulting and very insulting, not just to the students, but to Inga Berde. That, for example, bailiff apparently told Inga Berde, I need you to teach art. Inga Berde's response was, I have no experience teaching art. I'm a math and science teacher. Bailiff's response, according to Martin Micaiah, was, just make them draw a tree or something. And Inga Berde's response in the presence of Makaya was, you want me to lie to my people about what they should be learning? So you can get a sense of the complications in terms of North American aid workers with not just aid recipients, but other like, national aid, uh, aid workers um, from, from African countries. According to uh, the two stu former students I uh, interviewed, they took credit for ending the revolt by speaking amongst themselves, by among other things, try trying to um, come up with a plan that they could then transmit to Charles Bailiff and to uh, UNHCR staff. And, uh, the suit that as a, and as a result of the students' own discussions that they agreed to end the revolt and to have individual students speak with teachers about whether or not they wanted to stay at the school. However, their efforts to save Inga Berde's job failed, that Charles Bailiff um, basically ordered um, Inga Berde to uh, leave the camp, uh, to not come back to campus and dismissed him from the school. So to wrap up, since I've used up my half hour and I don't wanna to take too much time away from Marsha, um, I would say that on the one hand, there's a whole series of challenges in terms of using humanitarian uh, archives. And you're oftentimes going to be have to be in a position to not just rely on one archive, but rather a number of different ones as projects are oftentimes funded by different groups. Um, secondly, oral interviews are valuable when you can find them, but they're not necessarily going to be representative of most refugee experiences that this secondary school only had 100 students, 50 of which were student were Sudanese. And again, you're talking about 40,000 refugees who were, in, who were in the Congo in the late 60s and early 70s. That's hardly what you call a representative sample. Um, but even in, with those limited kinds of resources, there's still opportunities to try to triangulate, if you will, different archival sources with interviews. And with that, I'll stop if I've, I've already gone over my time. Mm -hmm.